Good evening, I'll call this meeting of the Janesville City Council to order. Please join me in standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In case of an emergency, please use the stairs and not the elevator to exit and then walk to the north side of the police department and wait there for further instructions. Item two is roll call. With clerk, please announce the attendance. Council President Benson? Here. Council Vice President Marshak? Here. Council Member Burdick? Here. Council Member Jackson? Here. Council Member Miller? Here. Council Member Nino? Here. Council Member Williams? Here. All are present, we have a quorum. Thank you. Um, I'm actually going to rearrange the agenda a little bit tonight, and I'm going to take new business item five first, because my family's here, and I'm the only council member this applies to. And I'm going to turn the meeting over to Vice President Marshak. <laughs> okay, item number five, uh, consideration and action on a proposed resolution recognizing Council President Paul Benson for his loyal and conscientious service to the city of Janesville as a city council member. Uh, can the clerk please read the resolution, but not the full proclamation? I think that's, or is that the same thing? It's the same thing. It's short. Okay, then let's read it. Resolution number 2024-2214, a resolution recognizing Council President Paul Benson for his loyal and conscientious service to the city of Janesville as a city council member. Whereas Paul Benson served the city of Janesville from 2019 to 2024 as a member of the city council. And whereas Mr. Benson served as city, co city council vice president in 2021 and council president in 2022, 23, and 24. And whereas during his term of service, Mr. Benson served as a member of the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee, the Sustainable Janesville Committee, the Indoor Sports Complex Steering Committee, the Library Board of Trustees, Oak Hill Cemetery Advisory Committee, Alcohol License Advisory Committee, Downtown Janesville Inc., and the Woodman Sports and Convention Center Executive Team. And whereas during his term, the City Council accomplished many achievements, of which Mr. Benson recognizes several significant accomplishments, including the development of affordable market rate and high-end housing stock, reducing the city's debt burden by transitioning to an increased level of cash financing for infrastructure initiatives, the development and construction of the Woodman Sports and Convention Center, securing city funding for the Children's Museum of Rock County, and the recruitment and hiring of City Manager Kevin Lehner. And whereas Mr. Benson's intelligence, thoughtfulness, and compassion for his community and its citizens characterized his tenure in office throughout, which is evidenced by his work to make the city of Janesville the community of choice. And whereas Mr. Benson performed the duties of the, as a member of the city council with an exemplary level of dedication, honesty, and integrity. Now therefore be it resolved that the city council of the city of Janesville presents this, recommendation, this commendation to Paul Benson to, in sincere appreciation for his loyal and conscientious service to the city of Janesville. Thank you. Do I have a motion? So move, please. Moved by Council Member Nino, second by Jackson. Comments? Mr. Nino. Uh, certainly to second all of the comments in the commendation, and I suppose only to say that it came too soon, too early. Uh, Paul, you'll be deeply missed, and you've been a tremendous force for positive uh, change on the, on the council during your, your tenure. It's I'm proud to have served with you, learned from you, enjoyed your example of integrity and leadership. Anyone else wishing to say anything? I will. Uh, it's been uh, an honor to serve with you. Um, being off cycle on elections, I knew this day would come when one of us would leave the other, but I uh, thought it would be the other way maybe. But no, it's been, it's been great, Paul. Your leadership has been wonderful and, and what you've accomplished and, and helped guide us through over the last couple of years here has been great. So thank you very much. Oh, you know, once you've been on for a while, you can always come back later. And, and, uh, <laughs> I've heard that. Yeah. It, it's okay to do that. And uh, we'd appreciate you doing that again. So think about it. Once the kids grow up, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I just want to echo what everyone has said. Um, I don't think there's a whole lot more that I could add. And we wish you good, good fortune, and uh, many, many more 
baseball and soccer games. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, let's vote. I think we don't have. Uh, I don't. You could do an acclamation. All in favor. Okay, all in favor. Please say aye. 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 I'll abstain. <laughs> Any opposed? And that passes unanimously with Council President uh, Benson abstaining. <laughs> Thank you. Kevin's I have the pleasure of uh, giving you a few things and uh, getting some pictures taken. So why don't you come Thank up you. to the front and I will present you with a couple of different items. I pre-signed the resolution assuming it would pass. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate your passing. <laughs> so on behalf of the city of Jean, I want to present you with the And uh, the city coin, which has the city's value on there, and so take it again. And last but not least, uh, the print of the city of Jamesville, from a local artist that we've given in the past for their leadership and conscientious service to the city of Jamesville. Obviously, if you would like to say a few year words, uh, you can do that, and then I will turn this back okay. over to you. Yeah, thank you all very much for the kind words. Um, first, I want to thank my family, who's here tonight, my, especially my wife, Jenna, who was a single parent on countless, countless uh, evenings and early mornings. So thank you for doing that, Jenna. I appreciate it. And to my kids, George, Charlie, and Henry, who uh, put up with me being away, again, for many, many evenings and many, many early mornings. So thanks for doing that, boys. I appreciate it. Um, thanks to the city staff, past and uh, current, too many to thank. I won't try to name names because I will undoubtedly leave people out, uh, but thank you to all the city staff. You guys made it um, very easy to do this job and make us look good, and you guys do so much behind the scenes. And I don't think people realize that every single issue before us, we get a detailed research memo, every single issue. So thank you for doing that. Um, also, thank you to all of the current and former council members. Again, uh, too many to, to name, I'm not going to try. Uh, but thank you to all of you, especially some of the ones who are no longer here who took the time to mentor me. You know who you are, and I appreciate it. Um, yeah, and thank you to uh, Vice President Marshak, who's you and I have been working together now for two years on many things. So thank you for all the extra time helping me with this. I appreciate it. We really shared the job, and I wouldn't have agreed to be president if you wouldn't be <laughs> vice president. So. Uh, yeah, my turn to leave first, but uh, I trust the rest of the other six of you and Larry, who's coming on, will do a great job. So thank you, everybody. <clears throat> okay. I'll now go back in the agenda to item three, which is consideration and action on a proposed resolution in support of National Library Week, April 7th through 13th, 2024. Would the clerk please read the file resolution? File resolution number 2024-2205, a resolution recognizing April 7th through the 13th, 2024 as National Library Week in the city of Janesville. Whereas National Library Week is a time to celebrate the many contributions of our nation's libraries, library workers, and the communities they serve. And whereas the city's first library began in 1865, serving the Young Men's Association in 1884, was adopted by the city, and officially became a community library, and was officially renamed the Hedberg Public Library in 1996 following extensive renovations. And whereas libraries have long served as trusted and treasured institutions for all members of the community, regardless of race, ethnicity, creed, ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, or socioeconomic status. And whereas libraries offer opportunities for everyone to explore new worlds and become their best selves through access to technology, multimedia content, and educational programs. And whereas the mission of Hedberg Public Library is to build community by providing in fighting spaces to 
discover, share, create, and connect, and to hold dear the values of inclusion, respect, access, innovation, service, and excellence. And whereas the library continues to provide first-rate service to the citizens of Janesville and its 30,477 library card holders, circulating 573,611 physical and electronic items in 2023, welcoming 206,791 people into our two library locations and 158,491 to our website's digital space, providing 790 programs for 26,000 attendees while also maintaining an active mo bookmobile. And whereas the citizens of Janesville love their library and are very proud of the resources and services the library provides to the community. Now therefore, be it resolved, the Common Council of the City of Janesville does hereby affirm and proclaim April 7th to the 13th, 2024 as National Library Week and during this week encourages all residents to visit the library to access resources and services and connect to their with their library. Thank you. Do I have a motion from the Council? So move, please. Motion by Council Member Nino. Do I have a second? Second by Councilmember Miller. Anything further, Councilmember Nino? When I joined the council, I became the appointed member to the Board of Trustees of the Hedberg Public Library. And initially, I thought that this was um, this was the position that was handed to the new the new person on the council. And when all the senior people got to be on the Planning Commission and other exciting stuff. And what I've found is uh, it, it's been a hugely rewarding job to be a member of the Board of Trustees, and it's only reinforced to me what a tremendous resource and treasure Hedberg Public Library is to the city of Janesville. I, I go back to uh, the children's section of uh, the old Carnegie Library um, many, many years ago. Um, and we're, what we've become now is, is uh, exemplary. Um, we're now entering into a, a great new phase of the library with a new executive director. Um, and I'm very excited by what that will hold. I think we've made a, a tremendous hire. Um, but before we get too far into the future, I think great um, thanks uh, is due to the existing staff and the board of trustees, uh, and especially to Charles, uh, who served as our interim director, and frankly, the library never missed a beat, and Charles was simply exemplary. Uh, it is a, a wonderful institution, and I certainly hope that the city, the citizens of the city will come to explore the library more than simply during this particular week. Brother Councilor Miller? I'd just like to say that libraries have certainly changed over the last uh, few years <laughs> since we used them when we were in grade school. And I can tell you that the library system has evolved into a more digital age, which has allowed us to connect um, people of all ages, people of all disabilities. And I think there's only greater things to come. So I'm very fortunate that we have an outstanding system and I hope that it continues to grow as technology grows and we in incorporate all of these things into our growing populations. Anyone else wish to comment on this item? Okay, we have a motion on the floor by Council Member Nino, seconded by Miller. Um, all in favor, say yes. 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 All opposed, say no. And that motion carries unanimously. And we have a copy of the resolution. Um, and with us this evening to accept that, we have two members of the library board, the president and vice president, Patty Hernandez and Katie Grogan, as well as our interim director, Charles, who's here to accept it as well. If you want to come forward and accept a copy of the resolution.
Good evening, honorable members of the city council, esteemed city officials, as well as our fellow residents of Janesville. I'm here tonight with Katie Grogan, the vice president of the Hedberg Public Library Board of Trustees. I'm the current president of the board. Katie's gonna be speaking in a couple minutes, but this week is the National Public Library Week, and I stand before you with deep gratitude. After serving on the library board, now I think this is my sixth year um, of immense pride in what we're doing at the library as we celebrate their invaluable contributions. Um, our libraries hold a very special place in our hearts, as well as the public library um, here has played a pivotal role in, our, um, in Janesville. We have a vast collection of books. We have multimedia resources. We have innovative programs. The Hedberg Public Library has empowered countless individuals to explore new ideas, pursue lifelong learning, and expand their horizons. From toddlers attending story time all the way to seniors participating in technology workshops, the library has welcomed patrons of all ages and backgrounds with open arms. Moreover, the public library has served as a catalyst for our community engagement, fostering meaningful connections and collaborations that enrich our community. Whether it's hosting library um, author talks, art exhibits, uh, civic forums, the library has provided a platform for our community to have dialogue, creativity, and civic participation. None of this would be possible without the steadfast support of our city council, as well as our dedicated city officials. Your commitment to Hedberg Public Library reflects your recognition of the vital role that libraries play in promoting education, fostering literacy, and enhancing the quality of life in our community. We would like to express our gratitude today. Let us reaffirm our collective commitment to pursuing and strengthening the Hedberg Public Library and for, your, um, for generations to come, just like you had mentioned. Together, we can ensure that it continues to serve our community of learning and be a source of inspiration, as well as a cherished community asset for years. I want to thank you for your ongoing support, your dedication, your vision in building a brighter future for Janesville. And now Katie has a few words for you. I just wanted to take a moment to express our appreciation first to Kevin Lanner and also to Tara uh, Semenchek for their role in helping us find our new library director. And I'd also like to take just a moment to express our deep appreciation to our current director, Charles Teevil. He's done a, just a, a wonderful, a fantastic job, as, as you pointed out, uh, Richard, and not only keeping us afloat, but beyond. And we offer him our sincere appreciation. And lastly, I'd like to make uh, just a comment about the staff. Our library is, has been referred to by a number of people as the crown jewel of our city. And yes, indeed, it's a, it's a beautiful facility, but much more than that, it's the people inside whose professionalism and dedication make it the crown jewel of Janesville. So again, I join Patty in thanking you for this uh, commendation and resolution, and uh, look to see you at our library soon to meet our new director. Thank you. That takes us to item four, public comments on items on the agenda, not requiring a public hearing and on matters which can be affected by council action. Did anyone sign up to speak this evening? Ty Bullerud. Uh, please state your name and address and you will have four minutes. Yes, uh, Ty Bullerud, 4608 Pendleton Court, Janesville, Milton, Wisconsin, <clears throat> up under number two uh, on the agenda, well that's GM. And basically, since that's new business, since the article was just in the paper last Tuesday, so that gentleman was never informed. Now we wrote a whole bunch of stuff. A mitigation plan. Uh, we got a tip plan. Uh, dang. Boy. Looks like uh, um, Walt rewrote a bunch of scribble on another time. One person we don't see on this, this side of the microphone is the uh, is a attorney's office. They never come to this side of the micro microphone, never. And there's good reason because if you have to hide your legal counsel, you know, you probably don't want them out here in front of the microphone, and you do. We're gonna file, uh, um, including what uh, Dwayne, we believe, uh, filed against us and was rewrote 
up under that mitigation plan, free and clear. We even we we accidentally got in, in the circuit court dismissed, and that's that's that filing that we'll uh, present next week. So we suggest that you don't um, vote on number two until next week. At least get the information. I got a copy right here, and uh, it was in the paper. The problem is we never had anybody like Mike Payne actually stamp it. And, and, and how do we get out of this situation? We were here four years ago. How do we get out of this situation? We put up a couple million dollars. That wasn't bad. Uh, a million on the Jackal side, a million on the GM side. We could uh, make uh, um, you know, electric trains. That'd be a great place. Jamesville um, has uh, all the tracks still hooked up to it. There's a lot of other cities, including um, the interconnected uh, cities in Wisconsin. So there's one place that could do it. Um, 2010, GM tracks on the bottom side, I believe, was bought from the Department of Transportation. But we can't get that information from, from the library. And if the library doesn't have it, it probably isn't around at all. Um, so the suggestion to put that $2 million into Mike Payne's hands uh, up under the... Uh, um, you know, the, whereas um, it states all public works, all public works. So, you know, A, let's put some money uh, to Mike Payne on either side. You don't have to file anything if it's, in, if, if it's in there. And this document that you guys probably will vote on tonight, at least uh, uh, you'll have something to go along with it. Otherwise, you got a what? A mitigation uh, hazard, hazard, hazard Rock County plan. You guys ain't Rock County. You're voting on a Rock County plan. How's that happen? You know, that's awesome. And then you already, what? There's nobody from the city that's actually ever posted uh, um, any, uh, you know, Richard, or I'm, I'm sorry, Frank Silla or Big John, unless you're going to send the posse to St. Louis, you know, and then, uh, uh, you know, t twisted three ways to Sunday. You know, basically, what, them guys are probably not going to get arrested and the key thrown away like Diane K. Fernandez. And that's a lot what this is filing, refiling on. More will come to people that are interested. But you guys are really stuck here because them guys ain't going to play. And it's going into circuit court unless we're going to start arresting the circuit court judges. I think they're going to probably gonna have to come up with something different. Larry Schomber. Uh, Larry Schomber, 833 Eisenhower. I was here March 11th with the hope of getting support for an extension of a sidewalk to Furman. Apparently, the city manager has the authority to bypass the city council. Because on May 15th, March 15th, a person from the engineering department came to our home and informed us the city manager made the decision not to extend the, defer the deferment. Later, on the 15th, we received a call from a council member stating they will be meeting with the city manager and I will have that council member's full support on extending the deferment. The council member called us back about an hour and a half later and said they were in contact with the council president and the item of the deferment extension will be on the March 25th council meeting agenda. We received a call on March 25th from the assistant city manager informing us there is no deferment extension. He was unaware that I had spoke with a council member and he had been in contact with the council president on March 15th, and the item was supposed to be on the agenda for the March 25th council meeting. It wasn't. This is one, many, this is one of many reasons the public is losing confidence in our elected officials. We deserve better. Thank you. The only two signed up on the sheet. Would anyone else like to provide a public comment this evening? Anyone else? Any written comments? There were none. Uh, Larry, I'll take it to I'll take blame. Councilmember Jackson did request that to go on the agenda. I was out of town on spring break, but it's 
being worked on. We are going to get it on an agenda. I'm transitioning off the council, but the council is not forgotten about this. Sometimes it just takes a little while to get things on the agenda. I should have been notified. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard thing when it starts at the council. I can't really open meeting laws, prevent me from discussing a non-noticed agenda item. Our rules are frustratingly handcuffing, um, but we can have, we'll have someone reach out. Sorry for the inconvenience. Um, that takes us to item five, which is our city manager update. Um, I'll turn over to our uh, city manager, Kevin Lehner. I have a couple of items uh, before I get started. Uh, I just wanted to say thanks to Paul um, for the short time that we got together. <laughs> um, I, I, <laughs> I, do, I do have to say it's a little bit unnerving as a city manager to see the face of your council president around every corner in the city <laughs> staring at you. With I'm always watching. With a smile. Yeah, that's what it kind of feels like. Um, but I just want to appreciate yeah. everything that you've done for the city. You've done amazing work. and. Uh, it's been great to work with you and, and looking forward to accomplish many more things. Yeah. And I know you're not far and yeah. you'll be around and involved. I will be. So, so thank you very much. Thank you. Um, got a couple of things for you this evening and then I'm going to turn it over to Jim Z. Um, just to, for the public's awareness, uh, there's been three finalists announced. Um, it was in the newspaper recently for the um, fire chief position. Um, and uh, after that first initial part of the search, uh, John Kalarik, Ryan Murphy, and Scott Sarber, uh, the public, uh, the police and fire commission will be meeting with the three finalists uh, for interviews on Monday, April 15th. Um, and then hopefully we'll be going into um, a, a discussion and decision uh, shortly thereafter or even on, on that day. So uh, getting steps closer uh, to hiring uh, the new fire chief. Uh, we have tonight a um, preview of Park Place Views with Amanda. Hello City Council, staff and residents. My name is Amanda Gilbert. I'm the communication specialist for the City of Janesville and the host of Park Place Views. On this month's episode, we feature Elena Knopfsinger with the Recreation Division. We talk about the 2024 Parks and Recreation Guide and all the fun things you can do outside in Janesville this summer, like heading to a great park and shooting some hoops. You can check out the newest episode on channel 994 or on JATV Media's YouTube. Ah. Crushed it. <laughs> <laughs> that was an unexpected ending. I was expecting her to swish it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just some upcoming events. Uh, April 11th, we have the child seat safety inspections uh, uh, from 8 a.m. to noon. April 23rd, we have a community engagement forum on the Palmer Park waiting pool renovations from 5.30 to 7. Um, and there was an update to that group uh, regarding um, the location and a recommendation um, to move the location of the waiting pool for various reasons. And so if you're interested in that item at the same general area, but just a little bit different spot in the park, um, if you're interested in that item, we recommend that you come to that forum. And then there's the Volunteer Appreciation and Award Ceremony on April 25th. And as always, sign up for uh, emails from our email list. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jim Z. Q. Warner, Economic Development Director. Good evening, Council. I'm super excited to be up here because I get to talk about my favorite subject which is just economic development overall. Um, so thank you for your time this evening. I have a few things I'd like to go over. And then, of course, if you have any questions or you want to dive into any additional subject matters, please do let me know. Um, everyone in my personal life knows this. I am a self-proclaimed economic development geek. I have a coffee cup to prove it. <laughs> and so um, I'm, again, super thrilled to be talking this evening. Um, you know, economic development is definitely a long game and it requires a lot of people, a lot of attention, a lot of dedication, um, resources galore, right? Uh, a lot of people who have a great vision and a big heart for their community. Most people that are in economic development don't have a degree in economic development. There are very few opportunities in the United States for actual degrees in economic development. Most of us fall into this track via other tracks, right? So maybe planning, 
maybe public administration, maybe marketing, maybe um, other aspects within um, the public sector, as well as the private sector. I actually came from the private sector. So um, our education is primarily done through our industry organizations, one of them being the International Economic Development Council. They offer a lot of different education sources, as well as a large network of individuals who are doing the same thing in communities across our country and globally as well. Um, we have people who are doing economic development on small scales for small communities who focus a lot more on community development. And then we have economic development folks who work on substantially large projects of over a million square feet of space and thousands and thousands of jobs. It is definitely something that is diverse um, and definitely takes a special breed of person for economic development. Traditionally, economic development had three legs to a stool and that was business attraction, business retention, and business expansion. Economic development has definitely become vital in the success of communities and has expanded its scope of work. And some of those additional aspects are, of course, redevelopment, workforce development, infrastructure needed to make things successful in your community, as well as strategic planning for your community. We also get involved with policy setting. So working with our local, state, and federal leaders on what is important for a community's success and economic development, different laws, policies, and financing options that are related to the success and economic development of a community, supply chain development, which means working with your existing businesses within your community, understanding who they are sourcing from and who they're selling to and how you have opportunities to recruit those businesses to be able to provide a more comprehensive supply chain for them in your community, which continues their success. Entrepreneurial activities. Um, here in Janesville, I don't just work with, or my team doesn't just work with the big projects. We meet with entrepreneurs, single business owners who have ideas, who want to launch businesses, and we'll meet with them and work with them on what are some of the steps to make that successful. How do they move their plan forward? And some of those assets might be working with the Small Business Development Center. Some of them might be feeding them into the Janesville Innovation Center as an opportunity for our entrepreneurs. Economic development has also got involved in housing, and that is something more recent for economic development staff members. We work with our community partners, especially our convention and visitor bureaus, and downtown associations on quality of life and community development. So the big one, the one that gets the most attention, is what is business attraction. Right, so this is the one that most stakeholders want to know about. This is the one that uh, gets the most press, the most articles written about it. This is the one that you get most scrutiny over. This is the one that requires the most resources. And this one potentially has really great ROI, but you really have to watch your ROI because as we all know, anyone who is in business attraction, sales aspects, it costs more to get a client than it does to keep a client. So business attraction, of course, most of us in economic development are not out there trying to attract any and all. We need to be targeted. We need to be able to utilize our resources wisely. And that is looking at different aspects in your community, such as your industry targets, your workforce capabilities. You can't successfully compete against other communities if you're trying to recruit businesses that you cannot fill their workforce needs. Workforce is their number one desire if they're going to a community. Can they hire people? So you need to make sure that you're fully aware of what your workforce capacities are. And if you are not exactly content with what the workforce capacity is in your community or you want to strive for different or more, those are conversations that you have with our education partners and workforce partners about how do we set end goals? How do we start changing our output? How do we start changing our talent? And then, how do we start targeting those different businesses? How? How do you do business attraction? Well, as a municipality, we definitely have constraints. We can't go out and buy a bunch of advertisements. You don't see me traveling all over the world trying to recruit businesses from different countries. So a lot of that is done by networks. A lot of that is done by actual boots on the ground, business development activities, and things that we can do to promote ourselves at low to no costs. Uh, attending trade shows and uh, working with different brokers, developers, um, real estate brokers, 
architects, engineers, whatever we can do to get the word out that we have an asset that they themselves or their client has or uh, desires. Some recent, oh, I did it again. What is the back button again? I always do this. It's the second one down on the screen that's on. I can't control it from over. There you and go. You got I it. can't see either. So, <laughs> <laughs> some recent uh, examples, of course, is our concerted efforts in the innovation park. So this is the 132 acres that we purchased in 2023, and that we're working through all of the infrastructure and planning to create a new industrial park. And so as we work through that, we will work with developers and businesses to attract them into our community. Um, we are looking at working at the first project, hopefully to launch in 2025, with the planning work that we've been working through with all of our partners um, here in City Hall in engineering, public works, the building division, the planning division, economic development. Um, we all are working diligently to make sure that this site is shovel ready, ready to rock and roll so we can have our first project starting in 2025. Business retention, extremely vital. When you are aware of the businesses that are in your community and have open communication, you get to know that business and what you can do to make sure that you keep that business in your community. This is a really good opportunity to flourish and get businesses to stay and grow. Um, we talk to existing businesses to see what are ways that we can help them. How can we help their supply chain? How can we help them stay in the community? Are they, um, are they constrained by land? Are they constrained by resources and funding? Um, and an example, of course, is United Alloy. We all went through that um, last year where United Alloy was doing some expansion projects. So we did a TIF development agreement where we conveyed some land over to them and facilitated their opportunity to do an expansion of their office space as well as their training space and 100,000 square feet of additional production space. Um, some of the other resources, grants, loans, connecting them with different other resources in education and workforce. We work with our workforce partners, are there opportunities to create custom training? Um, a business retention and expansion program is one of the vital aspects, and I'll go over what a business retention and expansion program is in a later slide. Also, business expansion. In addition to keeping a business, you want to be able to facilitate additional expansion. This actually has the potential in many communities to create more tax increment, more job opportunities, and more success overall. Um, especially for those business or those communities who may not have as much land availability is really truly understanding your existing businesses and facilitating them to be able to expand within your community either on the site that they're currently on or on another site or another existing facility that could use some investment to fulfill their needs some of the questions that you ask and try to identify, what are the pinch points for them? Are their sales growing? Are they able to keep up with their production? Is their warehousing space, is there enough of it for what they're producing? Do they need more space? And if they do need more space, do they have capacity where they are? Or do they need more space and that means that they need to find a different site? Do they own their building? Do they lease their building? Do they own land anywhere else? And is there potential to lose them to that other <coughs> community? Finding out what's critical to them is critical to a community. An example of a recent business retention and expansion that we've all been through too is Walter. So Walter had been in the community since the 1960s. They were sitting in a 30,000 square foot space. They were looking for an opportunity to expand. They were looking at other communities and we worked with them to be able to facilitate them to stay in Janesville. We worked through a TIF development agreement. They did end up with a city parcel of land and they are constructing their new 70,000 square foot facility. And if you drive by, you'll see that that is moving forward. Uh, it's quite beautiful. Also United Alloys construction project is quite beautiful as well. Um, business retention and expansion programs. This is an actual dedicated program um, many communities put a lot of resources into a business retention and expansion program. This is where you truly identify what are 
the larger employers in your community? What are some of the running themes of different industries in your community, right? Is that food processing? Is it heavy manufacturing? Um, is it aerospace? Is it agriculture? And you create what your targets are and identify these are the businesses that we really want to make sure that we connect with on an annual basis every other year or every five years. We wanna sit down, have a conversation with the decision makers in the business and ask them these vital questions of are they growing or are they having constraints? Do they own, do they lease? Um, are they planning to expand? Are they contracting? Do they plan to lay off? Do they need to hire a bulk of people? These are the types of questions that you ask in a business retention and expansion program. These are the types of questions that are tracked these are also opportunities where you can understand well, who is in their supply chain. If we have an employer that we know that's working with three other businesses here in Janesville, and then we find out that they're closing their doors, we can start planning because we know that that effect is gonna have a larger aspect than just that one business closing. Some of the vital partners for having an effective business retention and expansion program are those who are more tied into the private sector. There are examples of private economic development partnerships. There are examples of chambers of commerce who work with your city to be able to facilitate a business retention and expansion program. The reason is the private sector and the private sector, right? If, if you're asking very confidential questions and you're asking questions that are very much industry related, the private sector is gonna feel extremely comfortable speaking to another private sector leader. Then it's really about having a really great relationship with your municipality or municipalities to be able to share that information in a closed door situation and say, here's what we're hearing. Here are some of the ideas, here are some of the constraints, here are some of the concerns, and here are some of the gaps. One of the things that is really great too is what we call, or I call, a triple play. So if you have an opportunity for a development in your community that is a business attraction, business retention, and business expansion opportunity, it's a triple play. So again, another example that we recently went through was when Zilber built their 500,000 square foot facility and they leased it to Serta Simmons. So Serta Simmons had a facility in Janesville and they had a facility in Beloit. They combined the production and leased the 500,000 square foot space from Zilber. In that process, Zilber will be redeveloping the building in Janesville, and then they will bring in new tenants. So now we have attracted new businesses to Janesville. We have facilitated the opportunity to retain Serta Simmons, and we have also facilitated the opportunity for them to expand. Serta Simmons does plan on ad hiring additional staff. We have many partners that we work with. This is not a single member or a single team team, right? Like this is a full team effort. So just internally alone, we do have a development team that is involved with many of the departments. Again, we have public works, engineering, the building division, the fire marshal, the planning division, economic development, the management team, finance team. There are so many of us that work together um, to be able to facilitate the opportunities look and review through these projects that are coming in, not only on how they affect the land and the infrastructure, but also how they affect the overall success of our community. We do hold pre-development meetings with anyone who is interested in developing in the community, um, and that team meets on a bi-weekly bi basis, so every other week. Um, again, for economic development, these are the different departments that we work with consistently. I'm extremely grateful for all of my colleagues because we definitely have projects that are run, 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 and then stop, stop, stop. And then run, 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 and stop, stop, stop. So I'm extremely grateful for all of these different divisions. We all play a vital role in the success of economic development for this community. We also have partners that we work with day in and day out outside of this organization. And the success of this community would not be for them uh, helping as well. One of the things that we have looked at um, and wanted to review with the city council was a recent report that came out from the Wisconsin Department of Revenue. This will show you the value of the TID districts in 2001 at 158 million versus 2023 valued at 790 million. The increment in 2001 in those TIDs was 75 million but the increment of the TID districts today is over $507 million. 
So this is showing you that we truly are having success through our TID districts. The TIF is our only incentive option. Economic development is vital. And for us to be able to grow with the existing constraints that we have with our levy limits, economic development is a must. Our net new construction is our ability to raise levy limits. And years of levy limits that don't come close to what we need gives us options that are not acceptable. We do not want to cut services to our community. and We do not want to borrow excessively or defer what needs to be done for our community, for our community members on a daily basis. So continued efforts in economic development are extremely vital. Economic development ensures the success of our community. Keeping the status quo doesn't allow our community to provide those basic services. And none of us want to be able to deny a, an amazing community to live in. ED economic development initiatives require ingenuity, flexibility, and a willingness to be a fiscal partner. Why do communities invest in economic development? They definitely take a lot of resources. They require us to be very creative to overcome barriers. They require us to be strategic thought leaders. But we can create successful businesses, increase our tax bases, increase employment oppor opportunities, and create a place that people will really truly be successful to live, work, and play. I'd like to also make sure that you are aware of your economic development staff. I know I'm the one who's generally up here, but I do not do this alone. So we also have Ross Takis, economic development quarter, uh, coordinator, and Allison Frisky, our economic development admin. This is one thing I like to close on all the time. This is, again, me closing out on a geek factor. Economic development makes generational changes to a community. It truly is a long game. It takes a lot of effort to get there, but makes a massive, long effect on your community. So thank you. Any questions for Economic Development Director? Thank you so much, thank Gen you. Z. Thank you so much for all you guys do. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you for the presentation. OK, that'll take us to our consent agenda. Um, items 6 through 13 will pass under consent, unless any council members request um, to pull any of those off for further um, discussion. Item 6 is the City Council meeting minutes from the regular meeting of March 25 and the closed session of March 25. Item 7 is licenses and recommendations. Item 8 is consideration and action on a proposed resolution proclaiming April 2024 as Fair Housing Month in the City of Janesville. Item 9 is consideration and action on a proposed resolution proclaiming April 21 and 27 as Volunteer Recognition Week in the City of Janesville. Item 10 is consideration and action on a proposed resolution approving an assignment and assumption agreement which authorizes the sale of 4260 Capital Circle Drive from Capital Circle Property Trust Group LLC to GenCap DePier Recap LLC, the Bushel Family Trust, and GenCap Janesville Industrial MM LLC as tenants in common. Item 11 is consideration and action on a developer's memorandum of understanding agreement to extend public infrastructure at Ridges of Rock County Plat Number 3. Item 12 is consideration and action on a proposed resolution approving the final plat of Ridges of Rock County Plat Number 3. And item 13, consideration and action on a proposed resolution adopting the Rock County Hazard Mitigation Plan. Would any council members like to pull any of those items off consent? I see no requests. So items 6 through 13 will pass unanimously under consent. So if you were here for a license or recommendation by one of our committees, like the Alcohol and Liquor Advisory Committee, your um, item passed and you're free to leave. Thank you. <laughs> Anticlimactic, I know. Takes us, uh, no old business, takes us to new business item one, which is consideration and action on a request to waive certain special event fees for the Janesville Farmers Market. Um, this is something we do at least annually since I've been on the council. Would any council members like a presentation on this item? I see no requests for presentation. I'm actually going to recuse myself because I have a financial or business relationship with the farmer's market as the primary sponsor, so I'm not going to vote on this item. Um, is there, do I have a motion from the council? I would move to grant 
pavilion fee waivers to the Janesville farmer market, Farmers Market for 2024 season and authorize the city administration to review annually and approve fee waivers for 2025 and 2026. I have a motion by Williams, a second by Jackson. Anything further? I think it's good for the downtown. So. Yeah. I was just there Saturday. Love the uh, farmer's market at Uptown Janesville and looking forward to them being at Town Square. A great addition to our community. Anyone else wish to comment on this item? Um, all right. Uh, again, I will recuse myself, but I will still, since we can't vote, Digitally, I'll still call for a voice vote here. So all in favor of that, say yes. 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 Any yes. opposed, say no. So that motion passes 6-0 uh, with myself abstaining and everyone else voting yes. Um, item two is consideration and action on a proposed resolution approving amendment to number one. I'm sorry, approving amendment number one to the project plan and boundary amendment for tax increment finance district number 38. And with us is our economic, develop economic development director, Jibsy Kuborn, for a presentation on this item as well. Good evening again. <laughs> um, I'm going to open up by introducing Harry from Ellers, our consultant. Um, and then he will go through kind of the overview for the TID 38 um, amendment, the boundary amendment. And then I will be here to answer any additional questions that you may have in regards to the boundary amendment. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Harry Allen with Ellers. So tonight we're talking about TID number 38. Uh, we're amending this district. So there's a couple different types of amendments that you can do to tax increment districts. Uh, there's one that's a project plan amendment where you're amending the cost or the projects to be incurred within that district. And then you can also amend the boundaries. Uh, the boundaries are limited to four boundary amendments over the life of the district. Tonight, we're doing two amendments to TID 38. We're amending that project plan and we're amending the boundaries. So this is the first boundary amendment to TID 38. So there's still three that could be incurred later. There's no restriction on the amount of times that you can amend the project cost within the district. So with that said, just to keep everybody on the same page, I like to start with a little introduction, just what is TID, uh, how does it work? So essentially it's a financing mechanism where you capture the new taxes created by new development to pay for the project costs that were necessary to attract that new development. So the argument is that if you didn't pay for these project costs, that development and that incremental value would not exist within your community. How it works functionally is you create a geographical area and you freeze the value at the time of creation of that district so this chart does a good job of trying to represent how this works. That blue bar at the bottom, that's your frozen value from when you create the district. All of the taxes collected on that value continue to go to all the overlapping taxing units just as they did before you created that district. When you create this district, the intent is that there's new value created within that area. And so the taxes charged to that new development get retained within a special fund to pay for costs within that district that supported uh, that new development coming in. So that's what this purple triangle is trying to represent is those new taxes being collected on only that new value within the district. At some point down the road, the district will have recovered its project cost or you'll hit the 20 or 27 year mandatory life and you will close that district and all that value rolls onto the tax rolls of all the overlapping taxing units. Jimsy mentioned this earlier, but this is really the only local tool that exists within the state to promote economic development in your community. So looking at TID number 38, this is a mixed use district. There's a couple of tests that go along with tax increment districts, depending on what type of district it is. We'll touch on those here in just a little. Uh, I know it's a little hard to see on the screen, but TID 38 exists along Milton Ave. The south side, there's a yellow border uh, that is the existing district. And what we're doing tonight is amending the boundaries of the district to go north along Milton, uh, just picking up as few parcels as we can to start and to wrap in some of those parcels around the mall that are ripe for uh, some redevelopment projects. 
So what we're doing is adding nine parcels in total, which equals around 44 acres of land. Uh, we are also amending the project cost that can be incurred within the district. We're adding expenditure authority for half mile projects. So they're not directly within the district, but they're within the half mile boundary around the district. So they can be paid for by district revenues. Uh, we're increasing the total project cost with this plan amendment to around 3.9 million. Uh, that's adjusting for some different interest costs that came in on prior borrowing as well as a plan borrowing. And then we're adding around $3 million of half mile project cost. So in total, it's 3.9 million higher than what was in the original plan. This district was created October of 2019. So all the dates uh, as to when this district needs to close or when expenditures can uh, last be incurred, none of those change with this amendment. So this was created as a mixed use district under statute that has a 20 year life. Uh, that 20 year period hits in 2041. So you still have about 17 years of life on this district. Now getting to the required findings with this being a mixed use district, there's two tests that we need to prove uh, in order to make this amendment work under statute. So the first is that at least 50% of the total area of the district needs to be suitable for some type of mixed use development. So that's either commercial, industrial or residential. We need at least two uses and we need at least half the area to be developable. In this case, 85% is suitable. The really only the non-developable parts are the roadways within the district. Pretty much everything else is developable or uh, some type of redevelopment project. The other test that we have to meet is that uh, with a mixed use district, you can support project costs for newly platted residential but you're restricted to only having so much of the area of the district uh, be used for a, a newly platted residential type use. That maximum amount is 35% of the area of the district. In this case, we're only looking at 12%. Uh, a lot of this was in that existing uh, district with the amended boundaries on the very far northeast corner. There's one parcel that could be redeveloped as a multifamily type development, so we've included that as newly platted as well. But with both those developments factored in, we're far under that 35% max. Looking at the proposed development and cost, primarily we're talking about commercial development uh, throughout the amended area. So potentially a hotel, some activity and maker space, that multifamily residential, uh, all of these are still in the works, nothing is definitive at this point, but there, there's likely to be some commercial type development in this uh, amended area. And then the project costs that we're adding is a half mile improvement to some roadways. And I, those are called out in a blue box on the top of the screen here. Uh, so uh, extending north from the district, there's a roadway that's going to be supported by this tax increment district uh, that will benefit the TID itself and the surrounding area. Looking at some of the incremental valuation that could occur within this amended area, when we look at the existing value, there's around 19.3 million of current incremental value within the district. This amended area of all these projects that we're aware of potentially happening do come to fruition. That could add around 17 million of additional value to the district. Uh, which gets us up to around 37 million of incremental value uh, within TID number 38. Looking at the proposed project cost, I covered these at a high level earlier, but just to go a little more granularly, uh, items one through five, those are those half mile improvement costs, uh, which are really related to a roadway. Then we're also including some development incentives that were held over from the original project plan. Not the, the full amount wasn't expended from the original project plan, so we're just carrying forward the balance. There's no intent to use those, but the city does have flexibility. Should projects materialize and need incentives, that's still within the project plan, so you can act quickly when those pop up. Uh, there's some streetscape improvement budget left over from the original plan. And then interest on long-term debt. There was some previous debt issued to support projects within the original TID 38. 
And then this half mile road is intended to be funded by debt as well. Uh, so we're building in the potential interest cost on that and then as well as the financing and administration costs for the district. So when we add in all the revenues from that new development and then all those costs from the two debt issues and the administration of the district, we do show that the TID cash flows and it cash flows pretty well that by 2038 it could close, which is several years earlier than that mandatory termination date out in 2041. And then just to re remind everybody of the process to create a TID, it is a multi-step process. So tonight is the second to last step in the process. If you all adopt your resolution tonight, that sends it back to the joint review board, which is a board made up of all the overlapping taxing units. Uh, and they have the final say if the, uh, the but for test is met or not in this instance. So with that, that's everything I had. If there are questions, I'm happy to take those now. Any questions? Councilmember Jackson. Why isn't Creston Park a part of this? Creston Park is where um, that grocery store is, correct? Schnucks. Yeah, yeah Schnucks. Um, so both of those parcels mm. recently transferred hands, um, and we've spoken with them, and there is no plans to redevelop either of, those, either of those at this time. I heard what you said. It exchanged hands, or does that mean it's- They no. sold. They, they both sold. Yeah, okay. they both have sold within the last year-ish. Okay, thank you, Jim. Yes, absolutely. Other questions? Councilman Miller. When the, div when the WSCC was in the planning stages, we were sold on the idea that all of this growth around the mall would be organic, that if you build it, they would come mentality would prove to flourish in this area. So why are we now needing a TID to give incentives for that to happen? We have created this proposal to amend the project plan and the boundaries for TID 38 for several reasons. The mall is a challenged property to redevelop. The way that we move forward with our TIF development agreements are performance-based, right? Um, and also the general fund, you're right, right? Where we created, we picked out as few parcels as possible. We, we looked at this and the mall itself is a more challenged property and how to, to be a fiscal partner to help the redevelopment of the mall itself. We did not go through and do a huge swath of land up Milton Avenue because yes, the WSCC is a catalytic project. It will bring in other development opportunities. We do know that there are three or four other projects for redevelopment and brand new development along the Milton corridor that will occur in the next 12 to 24 months. We've already started to see those plans come in. They are not in the TID district. We, are very fiscally responsible in what we're looking at. And so, yes, the conversation is the city is making a large investment in the WSCC, right? And we know that it is a catalytic opportunity and will bring in additional investment. And that's already starting to prove itself because we at the city are seeing these projects come into the pipeline and they are not in the TID district. This is specifically looking at what makes the best sense in fiscal partnership for those opportunities that may create an even larger challenge. And redeveloping something like the mall itself, the building itself, is definitely something that would be considered more of a challenge to redevelop than some of the other parcels that are within half mile and mile and up in our larger uh, retail corridor off of the I-39, I-90 corridor. So. It is, it still is a catalytic opportunity. It truly still is a catalytic opportunity. This is just a few different parcels that we're adding in. Um, and I know that we try really hard to be very wise in what we're doing. And we know that when you create a district or you amend a district, you're, you're holding those funds, right? 
and those taxing bodies then have that held for the term of the TID. Um, but we do have the opportunity now, as we looked through the project plan, right, there are some infrastructure costs that the TID will be able to assist with that will not be passed on to our taxpayers. They're going to be worked through because of this district and the success of this district. We had a conversation, or maybe several, about the city trying to save the mall. And I don't think it's the city's purpose to save a failing business. And I look at this as if, again, are we opening Pandora's box? Are, are we trying to save this mall now? And then what do we do next year? Are we gonna try to save the old Toys R Us? And then are we going to try and save Creston Park? It looks like we're handpicking and we're, we're trying to save a specific property and be in that business of something we really maybe shouldn't. I think that when we work through targeted economic development and creating tax increment districts, we identify a purpose of why that district is necessary. And that district may be necessary for multiple reasons. Um, it may be necessary for industrial development on land that the city has obtained. Um, it may be necessary in lands that are being rezoned and reused for industrial uses, um, such as TID 40 for Project RIPE is the future of that project. Um, it may be necessary to create a tax in increment district to help with the dire need for housing. Um, TID 38's initial reasoning was to assist with the multifamily project off the Black Bridge Road. Truly, economic development looks at multiple reasons why we create a tax increment district um, as an agent of our community. Um, I, don't, um, I don't see creating the boundary amendment as saving one single asset. Um, it is truly working through an opportunity to be a partner in a difficult to redevelop site, as well as continue to facilitate catalytic and exponential opportunities. And if I'm not, if I'm understanding this correctly, and pr please correct me if I'm wrong, but this essentially is tying up taxes that would go to the general fund essentially for up to 20 years. We will not see tax relief or have that tax affect our, our taxpayers? That is with all tax increment districts, yes. But again, we have some other um, positive aspects. Again, with the infrastructure ability of this tax increment district to be able to help some of the infrastructure that needs to be approved within the half mile. Um, as well as, again, when you look at the whole picture of this portion of our community, we are not the only community who has an asset like this. We are competing against multiple cities who are sitting on an asset like a mall that is extremely challenged. And we have the ability to make a difference and do something different. How do we create a better opportunity for our community? How do we differentiate ourselves? And one of the few ways that we can do that is through TIFs. And we are definitely diligent in this community as we're moving forward to make sure that when we're working through our TIF development agreements that these are performance-based. I think City Manager Lander wanted to address something. Yeah. Yeah, and just um, to add to what Jim Z said, our, our track record on TIF districts has been very strong. Um, and we, ultimately what happens with the TIF districts is they get added back onto our base. And without them, the development doesn't happen. It's the only tool that we have to utilize, to work with development teams in order to facilitate growth within our communities. If we had other tools, we would use them, but the state legislature ties our hands when it comes to those sorts of issues. So you have to look at the whole issue and the totality of the entire city. We have various TIF districts opening and closing as we go through the life of our city. And as those districts close, those full values come onto the tax rolls. And we continue that cycle to facilitate growth. Our track record on facilitating growth is very strong. It continues to be very strong, and the reason for that is through the management of our a long term management of our TIF districts and being very fiscally prudent with when we create them, how we create them, and making them performance based. I have a 
just a follow-up question. Um, we're not extending this to 20 more years, right? So there's only 15 years left and you actually project potential closure in 13 years. It has the ability to, if numbers are true and they run through the projects, Sorry, run through as proposed, as projected, right? It could close in 2038. Okay. Um, but it has legally the ability to stay open until 2041, and all tax increment districts must have their financial obligations set within five years of closure. So we wouldn't do any TIF development agreements after that, right? So five years prior is, uh, we would cut that off. And the increment is held, but the base value continues to stay on the tax rolls, correct? Absolutely. Okay. And this is, you know, by law, we have all of our taxing bodies who review this. Um, we also do an annual meeting with the Joint Review Board, which is all the taxing bodies, and they get to see the performance of every single one of our districts. Okay. Other questions? Um, there's no public hearing on this item. Um, so I would look for a motion from the council. I would make a motion to adopt a proposed resolution approving amendment number one to the project plan and boundary amendment for tax increment finance district number 38. A motion by Vice President Marshak. Do I have a second? Second by Council Member Williams. Anything further, Vice President Marshak? Um, yeah, I mean, I think part of the the situation we have is, I feel like we've really, in the last, I don't know, five, 10 years, really started to grow our, our TIDs, right? And so it looks like right now we're adding all this stuff, we're not getting it. We've got to look out 15 years, 17 years. You said it's a long game, right? It's a generational thing. So what we're doing now um, is really setting up the next generation, and, and we are really going to start seeing some huge benefits to this. I don't know, maybe 10 years from now, but it just seems like recently we've really started to grow these TIDs. So it feels like we're putting all this money and it's not coming back yet, but it will. And we just have to be patient and uh, yeah, that's what I have to say. Councilmember Williams, anything further? Yeah, I wish we had different tools. I'm not a big fan of this, but this is the only tool that we have and it gets looked at by the plan commission, it gets looked at by the city council, it, get look, it gets looked at by the joint review board, all the taxing districts. Um, one thing that might be helpful, and I don't know if it's available online right now, but can we have a list of the current TIDs and when they're going to be closing? Yes. Um Right now you can see on the GIS map all of the districts, mm -hmm. but the closure dates, um, yeah, we can get that I to mean, you. I that, mean, that would be kind of helpful to mm -hmm. see. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great to see. Yeah, um, 2017 will be the next one to come up closed. Um, I mean, t 17, not 2017, 17 will be the next one to come closed. That's closing how soon? That will be closing, but we'll probably re look through a one-year affordable housing extension, but that one is, yes, Pretty coming close. up. Okay. Again, I'm going to support it. I wish we had better leadership in, in Madison that would give us the money that we need. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else wish to comment on this item? Councilmember Miller? I, I did have a question involving the, um, the change. Why are we incorporating newly established, newly re renovated businesses? You're looking at the nine parcels? Yes. Um, for us to be able to be contiguous, we have to have parcels that are contiguous and couldn't do the right side because of the, the cemetery, right? So we had to go on the westerly side of Milton Avenue and we picked up as few parcels as possible to go from TID 38 up and around the mall. Um, we couldn't extend TID 37. There was way too much residential, and that is not within state statute. But we, we did pick as few parcels as possible. I do know there is a couple in there that are newer buildings, um, but that was the, the way we could stay within state statute. And all of these have to be within a half mile, my understanding? No. Or they have to be contiguous? They have to be contiguous. Contiguous. Yes. Other comments? Um, I'm happy to support this. I shared Council, Member's concern, Council Member Miller's concerns when this was initially proposed that uh, we were going to give up all of the value that we're hoping to create from the Woodman Center, but I was happy that this is so narrowly tailored 
to basically just grab the mall site um, and not many of the properties around the mall. So for example, if a hotel goes in up the street to the north, you know, we're not gonna, depending on where, but that's, the, that site's probably not going to be in the TIF. So I was excited to see that. Um, I do think that the mall property is a uniquely challenged site that does merit this level of investment from the city. I think anytime we do this, it's pros and cons. Um, but I think that site specifically, I think is just because of its location, because of the cost that it would take to tear the whole thing down and start over, um, because it's right in the smack dab middle of our commercial corridor, I do think it merits this level of investment. So like Councilmember Williams, I wish we had other tools, but this is the only one we have. We're already investing, you know, quite a bit of city money on that site. So I think we should continue to invest and yeah, play the long game um, so that we can see the, you know, that Milton Avenue corridor stay vibrant for another generation. So I'm happy to support this. Um, motion on the floor by Marshak, seconded by Williams. Um, maybe we should do a roll call vote on this one, Lori. Sure, President Benson. Yes. Vice President Marshak. Yes. Council Member Burdick. Yes. Council Member Jackson. Yes. Council Member Miller. Yes. Council Member Nino. Yes. Council Member Williams. Yes. <clears throat> and that motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you Jimsy. <laughs> Okay, uh, that takes us to new business item three, which is first reading and scheduled public hearing on a proposed ordinance amending the Common Council's procedure concerning ALAC and police chief granted temporary special event alcohol beverage licenses. Would the clerk please read the ordinance? Ordinance number 2024-891, an ordinance updating the procedure for granting and issuing temporary special event class B alcohol beverage licenses with penalties and injunctive relief for violation thereof as set forth in JGO 6-104. Thank you, and we will set that for a public hearing on April 22. Um, item four is scheduled time for the organizational meeting on Tuesday, April 16 at 7.30 a.m. Um, does that work with everyone on the council? I don't think this has been ran by the council. Am I correct? So this is the annual organizational meeting where um, uh, Larry, who's in the back there, will get seated and vote on president and vice president. And then normally there's a meeting with the city manager immediately after to set the next agenda. So it is important that everyone comes to this meeting. So is, does that time work for everybody? Is there a chance we can push it to eight? You know, I'm not gonna be here. It's fine with me. I'll leave it up to the rest of you. <laughs> I will not be joining you. Some of us have children to get yep. off to school. <laughs> we did, I believe we moved a date for the same reason when I was, because I also take kids to school. Um, does 8 a.m. work for everybody, and is that okay with city staff? Kevin, is that okay with you guys? Larry, do you hear this? Larry Squire? <laughs> <laughs> He's retired. He's We're, uh, retired. Can you come in? <laughs> We're scheduling the organizational meeting for April 16 at 8 a.m. instead of 7.30. That works. 8 a.m. Okay. Works. So that, that works for everybody? Okay, so yep. that'll be set for 8 a.m. on Tuesday, April 16. Uh, we already handled item five. We'll turn to item six, which is common council announcements. Any announcements from the council? I'll just say thank you again to staff and council. It's been a pleasure to serve with you all. I would just like to congratulate all of the appointed deputy chiefs. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll move then to item seven, which is consideration. It's the last time I had to read one of these paragraphs. <laughs> <laughs> Consideration of one or more motions to convene into closed session pursuant to Wisconsin statute section 19.851C for the purpose of considering and taking action concerning the employment, promotion, compensation, or performance evaluation data of any public employee over which the governmental body has jurisdiction or exercise of responsibility, specifically Janesville City Manager Kevin Lehner. Do I have a motion to convene into closed session? Motion by Jackson, second by Williams. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. That motion carries unanimously. Kevin, we have a little bit of housekeeping to do that came up during the week before.